Welcome to What If Geography, the podcast. This is the podcast uh, where we talk about you know geography and what if scenarios and all of the kinds of different things that could p- potentially be pertained with inside that <laughs> those concepts, which is really basically everything, as I usually say. A wide, um, wide realm. A wide, yeah, it's a wide, wide realm. Um, and I really wish um, people could listen to a lot of our brainstorming sessions like we just did before um <laughs> this before we started recording today because um it's just it's wild just how I mean, there's not really like a limit or uh, a ceiling for how much we, we can an, well, maybe we need an outtakes reel or something like that a bloopers reel or something where we can just behind the scenes or something like that that's not a bad idea actually um although i don't we, we don't really have bloopers I think the, the, well, the bloopers just <laughs> happen normally. I suppose. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say the blooperiest we get is like probably happening during the actual recordings that people hear. So um, yeah, maybe a behind the scenes or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Behind the scenes would be fun. And actually, so, um, so this is the, uh, so everybody who's listening right now knows this is the first time that uh, Hunter and I are recording where we're not in the same room. We're using zoom. We can see each other, but it's not live uh, in person with each other. Yeah, so that that does create a different dynamic because, I mean, we don't we don't record ourselves. Um, we don't record our like you know camera right. Um, That's when, right. We, when we're when we're in person, we don't have like a we don't have a There's webcam. No it's not like a recording. Yeah, I mean we're recording audio, audio, obviously. That's yeah. right. Um, but this time there is. And so, you know, maybe that's a little bloopy, you know, maybe there's some bloopers there that's, uh, that would, that's where it filters through. If I like spill my that. drink somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, I guess we can just sort of launch into, uh, introductions. Um, at this point we are episode, um, I don't know what, what, what episode this will actually be this five. No, cause oh, episode no. six at this point we've. Yeah, at this point we've uh, released four episodes, but we have another right. one coming, so we're recording yep. this um, well in advance. So there'll be another one. Anyways, all that's to say is there's a number of episodes out there. You probably that's heard true. our spiel. <laughs> um, well, I, I can sort of launch into it. Um, uh, my name's Jeff uh, Jeff Gibson. I I am a geographer and you know cartographer and city planner and all that fun stuff, uh, and I host a. YouTube channel of the exact same name, which is what if geography. Um, the the context is a little bit different in that in this podcast, you sort of get to listen to myself and Hunter co-host, who will introduce himself in a second, um, sort of riff and talk at great lengths about sort of the topic. Um, and the YouTube channel is more concise and you know, a little more flippant, for lack of a better word. Um the highlights. There, it's the highlights, right? It's um, and and you get to see some pretty pictures and some pretty graphics and and all that fun stuff. So, um, you are welcome to um, you're you likely you you are probably listening to this on YouTube. I think that's where most of our listens come from at the moment. Um, like we have thousands of listens on YouTube at this point, um, and only you know a few hundred on uh, podcast apps, as far as I can tell. Um, that could change. But- that I will hopefully right. Hopefully, um, don't you? you know, I don't, it's it's funny you bring that up because I don't actually, I don't know how much people actually listen to it on YouTube because um, I just I don't think the format works as well for a podcast on YouTube. I think it naturally, you know, we and we've talked about this before. It's like you're cooking dinner and you have a podcast on in the background. You're, you're folding laundry. You're going for a walk. You're going for a walk. You're driving, you're driving your, car. In your car. Yeah. yeah. Um, which you obviously can't do. I mean, I guess you could do those things. Well, please don't drive your car and watch YouTube, but, um, in theory <laughs> you could, you know, have YouTube on in the background and watch a video while you're cooking. But I just don't think, you know, that just doesn't really lend itself in my opinion to podcasts, which is, um, more of a passive activity. Uh, I mean, that's how I sort of listen to my podcast. Although if you're accessing this on YouTube, don't stop, of course. <laughs> yeah, don't stop. Yeah, um, we don't want that. It's just, um, you know, I am, yeah, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, I will turn it over to my co-host uh, to introduce himself. Hello, my name is Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. I'm also author of a couple cultural atlases, uh, one called Portlandness. Cultural Atlas, 
and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. My co-author for those is David Bannis, and it, they're books that involved a lot of collaboration, a lot of contributions, and Jeff was a major cl- uh, collaborator for Upper Left Cities. So if you're interested in geography and interesting maps and infographics, please check it out. Yeah, yeah, fun books, um, highly graphical Um Honestly, makes a great coffee table sort of gift book. Um, I know the holidays are coming up, so um, <laughs> if you're struggling like, for a gift idea, this could be just this, it for the geography. This could be it, yeah, life. yeah. And actually, on that note, um, and actually, I don't know even know if you if you know this, Hunter, but I I am now the I am now a permanent instructor at Portland State in the geography department. Um, I should know this. Yeah. <laughs> I I will be permanently teaching the map design and production class. So that's fantastic. That's yeah. great news. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 fun class. So hey, if you're uh you know in Portland and you want to take a class at Portland State University, why not map design and production? You can learn that's, from me. <laughs> that's a great idea. What, what term is that going to be offered next? You know? I you know I think it's always spring. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's coming up. Yeah, so this is a class that I actually took when I was an undergrad at Portland State. Um, loved it, and then I first taught it last year in spring, and now um, I just you know just got the call up saying, "Hey, do you want to do this again?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure." And um, and they were like, "Is this something you'd want to do permanently, or at least you know indefinitely?" And I was like, "Absolutely," because it's a fun class. Sign and, them up. Yeah, yeah, let's go. This is mm-hmm. fantastic. And, and I. Uh, I always do this. It gets a little bit of a tangent. Um, and we will get to today's subject, I promise. That's right. It'll happen. <laughs> um, but when you're teaching at uh like a college, uh, I think the the return on investment comes when you can teach the same class over and over again. Cause that's yeah, it it takes a lot to get a class up and running. Mm-hmm. And and then the second time it's also difficult. It's always kind of challenging, but nothing is like the first time. It just takes an enormous amount to really put it all together the first time. Right. There's so much. I mean, there's just so much um, uh, materials to pull together uh, that you spend just a ridiculous amount of time. So to be able to keep doing it over and over again, it's like, okay, I can I can make this work. <laughs> and it's just refining things. It's just refining know. things. Yeah. 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 And obviously, you know, for those of you who missed the introduction uh hunter is a professor um so he knows this very well um (laughs) the process that goes into it um okay so i guess uh with that uh we can sort of actually dive into today's episode and i'm just gonna let hunter kick us off here um actually but before i do i i just sort of um so as everybody or maybe people know uh, maybe we described this in the first episode i can't remember um but hunter and i sort of trade off topics um and we kind of have different styles in going into it, and I think it's fun. So I, so I'll come up with a topic, and then I'll share that topic with Hunter, and he 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 does his fair amount of research on it and comes prepared. Um, I'm a little different. Um, I I kind of like to go in blind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be able to Although spitball. you've done research on many of these things, for example, for today's topic, you've researched this for the YouTube channel. So yeah, it's not that is true. Yeah, that is true. This so yeah the today's um, so. For the No Borders episodes that uh, we recently published, I hadn't done really any research on, um, and that was really fun for me because um, I have you know thoughts and ideas in my head um, that you know are either you know right or wrong. You know that that's why you've done amount of research. You can sort of I'm the color commentator. You know? Right, right. At that point. <laughs> um, to use a sports analogy, to use a, a sports little foreshadowing analogy. by the way. Foresh- <laughs> yeah. Um, so. But yeah, for today's episode, I you know obviously it's one of my current episodes, so I've I've done a little bit, but not again, not nearly to the same degree. So, um, it's a it's a fun dynamic. I really enjoy it, um, and so I'm just gonna I'm gonna let Hunter sort of take it take it away, and I'll I'll be commenting and, and talking in between. <laughs> all right. So after all of this introduction, the topic for today is what if the fisheries of the world collapse? And yeah. I'd like to give you a little bit of background on this to give you an idea just to frame the the situation. Of course, people have been depending on oceans for food throughout all of human history. Mm. Uh, apparently, an estimated at least 3 billion people depend on fish or seafood as a protein source. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, by another estimate, uh, by the World Wildlife Foundation, uh, it's 50% of the world's uh, human population. We're at about 8 billion people almost today, right? Or 7 billion. And yeah. uh, so we've got 
a lot of people who are depending on, on fish for protein source for their nutrition. The food industry uh, involved in, in fisheries is, depending on the statistics you get, could be up to a $400 billion a year industry. This is 2018 data from the FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And a lot of the research that has been pulled together today, a fair amount of it comes from this organization. Is that just like... um? like corporations that are fishing, like actually fishing in the ocean, or is this like filtering out into like long John Silvers? <laughs> well, no, this involves, uh, I guess the, the initial sale of, of, of fish, mm. but it, it also involves um, the processing of fish it involves transportation. Mm -hmm. I'm not clear on how much of long John Silvers is involved in this. Um, but you know, it, it involves people at the different process at the different moments of the of the uh, process of, mm -hmm. of catching fish, processing fish, and selling fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and you know, to that to that, uh, fisheries and aquaculture and aquaculture is a little bit different. Fisheries, and I'll define it in a moment, are, are more of the wild variety and aquaculture, more farmed fish, support the livelihoods of some ten to twelve percent of the world's population. Uh, and ninety percent of these people who are involved in fishing for livelihood do so in small scale fisheries. However, as you know, we're going to talk about large scale uh, industry uh, and industrial sort of scale production of of harvesting fish really mm -hmm. accounts for a lot of it. But there are a lot of people who are involved in small scale subsistence, and then some resale uh, beyond that. So fish make up some seventeen percent of meat consumption globally. Mm -hmm. I do remember that stat. I had that. I think I had that in my video. Yeah, um, so we're, 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 we're consistent on that one. That's good to have some coherence between the channel and, and what we're doing here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can find stats on everything. So um, that's right. I'm glad that that one is cons <laughs> that one's consistent. Be critical of our statistics. I mean, this is a guideline for thinking about things. This isn't to mm -hmm. be taken at super uh, gospel face value, but this is a guide to thinking about things, a, a general mm -hmm. idea of what's probably happening. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that. Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah. Before we before we uh, move ahead, um, we we're talking very quickly about small scale fisher uh, fishers um, versus large yes. scale. Yep. Um, a little bit, and I wanted to um, sort of qualify that a little bit, um, and I, or or maybe not even qualify it, but just um, contextualize it a little bit. So, when we're thinking about large scale fisher fishers, are we thinking um, like those? Or is this a, like a size of ship thing? Is this a size of haul thing? All right, what, what are we thinking? Or is this like, for example, China has very infamous China, like a, a, the Chinese fishing fleets that are out there that are right. Among other enormous, countries. right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's the scale of capture really that we're talking. Okay. About. Right. So if you haul in, you know, a thousand pounds of fish versus a hundred pounds of fish, right? Yeah. Like that. I don't know what yeah, the, I don't know what the scale, it, I don't know what the breaks are, but right. It's it's the general scale. And so mm -hmm. uh individuals who are involved in fishing mostly by hand, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with either nets or poles, and that's one thing. But then when you have fleets, as you're suggesting, that's something else. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think um you know fishing is obviously you know a sport in the US. Um it's a sport in a lot of countries. Um I think what what we're talking about in terms of you know fisheries collapse wouldn't apply to the person who likes to go fly fishing in their local river or the person on the you know Santa Monica pier with a fishing pole out. <laughs> yeah, this is people river. whose business is involved yeah. and whose mm -hmm. livelihoods are dependent upon harvesting fish uh, from the sea and aquaculture, also mm -hmm. inland, also inland uh, waters. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That's a smaller percentage. And there's certain, there's a geography to that, of course, there's certain mm -hmm. parts yeah. of the world. Mm -hmm that are, are more involved in that and the other. Um, I will say that since everybody who's listening to this in 2022, at least, knows that inflation has been really significant in just about any product that you, you're going to try to go out and buy. And in the first four months of 2022, the price of fish has risen 25%. Wow. So think about that for the fact that you have 3 billion people, you know, almost half the population of the world, perhaps, depending on a significant amount of their protein mm -hmm. intake from this and that the price has risen by that by that amount 25 percent and so yeah. that's that's no small amount and so inflation has has impacted the fish mm -hmm. industry just as it has in everything else 
Well, and that that's that's beaten inflation, right? Isn't inflation somewhere like eight to ten to maybe even twelve percent, depending on the country? But well, this was the first four months, so mm-hmm. I'm not sure what it's been since then. Yeah. Um. So yeah, maybe it's not quite as significant. Of course, when we're mm-hmm. talking about seven or eight percent, we're talking about all industries, right? And so right. yeah, that's just having true. to parse that out a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, what are we talking about? Refrigerators. We're talking about fish. We're talking about yeah other resources is going mm-hmm. to be uh, you know if we're talking about cars it's going to be something else this is this is precisely why i'm a geographer and not an economist <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it <laughs> but i do understand it when you know something is 25 percent more expensive than it was maybe last year <laughs> it's easy to appreciate that all you have to do is go shopping and you figure yeah. it out right absolutely yeah and we actually so we touched on that like not to go back a little bit but yeah let's um, do we it touched a little bit about that in our you know, our previous ep- one of our previous episodes on you know no borders and talking about grain um, prices. You know, because of uh, well, I think there's a lot of there's a confluence of events, but a, certainly not a small event would be you know the war in Ukraine um, That's right. that that caused a, a spike in in the price of grain worldwide. And you know, I've I've seen that at my grocery store where the loaf of bread I used to get used to cost you know sub two dollars now it's three dollars you know (laughs) and that's that's the global economy to some degree at work right Mm -hmm. well how about some definitions some terminology because we're using all kinds of terms here and these are a lot of people kind of know these a little bit intuitively but it's good to sort of go over them just to make sure we're all on the same page because we've already been talking about fisheries and what is a fishery a fishery is a site where fish are caught and it involves perhaps three different components an area or a habitat right Mm -hmm an aquatic species mm-hmm. and people. So fisheries refers to specifically the act of catching fish. And so mm-hmm. sometimes fishery also beyond a site where fish are caught will refer to the business of catching fish or the fishing fishing industry more broadly. Um, and generally this doesn't necessarily include aquaculture. It, it may or may not, but generally fisheries are considered to be wild caught fish. Right. And I think, the important distinction that I and I, I believe I made this in my uh, YouTube uh, video of a similar name um, is that a collapse of worldwide fisheries does not mean um, that there are no more fish. Right. It doesn't mean that. Yeah. That fish have disappeared suddenly, completely yeah. off. Fish. That's like that would doing. that would be catastrophically bad for the planet for right. a number of reasons. Um, but rather, this is more. A fisheries collapse, you know, to this to this angle, it's more of um, sort of we're just not really able to get food from the sea as we need. That's to. right. We're not. It's not a dependable source of food on any any scale. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so we t- we keep using the term fish as well. So we might as well sort of <laughs> suggest what that means here. And again, for the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, fish are fish as we usually think of them, crustacean, mollusks, and other aquatic animals, but excludes aquatic mammals, it excludes reptiles, seaweeds, and other aquatic plants. So that gives you a little bit better idea of what we're talking about. A lot of times when we're talking about seafood, fisheries mm-hmm. would include. Yeah. Does does that include uh crab? Well so you said mall no it, does that crustaceans. Yeah. Crustaceans. So I mean okay. crab would be included in that. Yeah. yeah. And so the reason why I I was I was curious because I actually just saw an article recently. Um, this is dated October sixteenth, twenty twenty two, and it's around Alaska, um, so that's fairly close to home for us. Um, and, and for people who don't maybe don't know, maybe this is the first episode you're listening to, um, Hunter and I are both lo- located in Portland, Oregon, so a little bit close to Alaska. Um, but the title and this is a CNN article from uh, mid October: uh, "Billions of snow crabs have disappeared from the waters around Alaska." Scientists say overfishing is not the cause, but rather climate change. Okay. So there's a different. So there's another. I think there's. It's just going to show that there's another angle that maybe it's not overfishing, but there's other things at play that will cause still collapse. Well, we will definitely touch mm-hmm. on what some of the causes are. Mm-hmm. My sense is that the largest causes are overfishing, but that's not mm-hmm. the only cause, and climate change definitely plays a role here as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
there's a term, I'm not sure if we'll use it too much here, but I thought I'd bring it up because I saw, I found it in my research. It's called blue transformation. Have you heard of this blue transformation? Before? Blue transformation. No, I've never heard of that. And it's an effort to maximize aquatic food systems and diets globally uh, to increase food security, right? So mm -hmm. in other words, the ability of people to feed themselves while doing so sustainably and affordably. So it's interesting that at the same time we're talking about, well, what if the fisheries of the world collapse? There's also an enormous amount of belief, hope that feeding uh, people from the sea is actually a viable way forward if it's done sustainably. So it's interesting that we're talking about what if collapse, but also the idea that we can transfer a lot of our you know, protein needs, not only to plants, but away from land dwelling meat mm. and to seas is something that people are talking. About. Yeah. And I, I, Again, you know, in my research, you know, I talked a little bit on this. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, if we if we if we compare and contrast sort of land based agriculture versus ocean agriculture, um, yes, they are very different in a lot of ways, right? So, uh, land based agriculture, let's take cows. Um, you know, okay. that's yep. everybody's favorite hamburger. Um, you typically have a somebody who's you know ranching those cows you know in the thousands or there are you know corporations that are ranching them in the thousands if they're on a ranch they might also they're be in a ranch or a cafe or in a, on a feedlot that's right yeah, if you're in the I, united states because that's the way that it exactly a lot, of, a mm -hmm. lot of it works in the united states yeah anyways it's so it's but all that's to say it's very um even if it's just a ranch but you know it, it can get far more industrialized it, in the way it's all industrialized right there's a there's a very specific process that goes into it there um, monitored, they're tagged, they're all these different things. Um, there's a lot of like crops that are grown specifically to feed those cows. Um, I don't think the same thing happens with seafood and fish, right? You can have fisheries that are sort of dependent on, but I don't think somebody's going out there and herding the fish necessarily. I think that they're going to where the fish go. Is that, am I wrong on that? I think that's true to a certain degree, but when we talk about aquaculture, we are talking about something that's a little bit more similar to what we're talking about in terms of land-based meat production. Mm -hmm. And animals are captive, and yeah. they're also fed a diet that humans provide for them. Mm -hmm. So with aquaculture, which is seen as, as, as promising in some ways mm -hmm. for, for, for feeding people and for food security, there are some similarities there. But with fisheries, it's we're talking about seeking wild animals, catching wild animals and, and, and bring that mm -hmm. into. So I, so I guess this leads to a question that I have, and I, I've kind of always had, um, and I actually didn't, and this is not a question that came up while I was doing my research for my video. Um, but now maybe you stumble across it or maybe not, that's fine. Um, there is a, so if, if you look at, you go to your grocery store and you see, you know, a, slice of you know whatever fish that you're going to buy yes um, there's almost always a tag as sort of a promotion part of it that says this is a wild caught fish right as in this is not sort of a factory farmed fish um because the i guess the idea is that that is a negative and i'm curious why like, is is there anything out? Why is that a negative if something is a farmed fish versus a wild fish? And I, I don't know if we're going to be able to answer that offhand, but uh. I mean, I, I, my understanding is that there are certain concerns uh, with farm raised animals that mm -hmm. they might not be as healthy, uh, as natural as something that's caught wild. And mm -hmm. I think that probably depends a lot on the species as well. Okay. So I think a like lot I've, of I've seen it particularly really around different. salmon, I think. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, another thing, though, is that identifying fish is, can be really tricky because once a fish is processed, mm -hmm. it can look like a lot of other species <laughs> of fish. And there have been a number of different studies where uh, researchers have gone into restaurants, they've gone into supermarkets, mm -hmm. they've gone into fish markets, and they've tested fish, and they've recognized that many fish, in certain cases, are not the fish they're advertised to be. Mm -hmm. So what this speaks to is the fact that it's already hard to track industrialized food, whether that's corn is very hard to track from its source. Industrialized meat is hard to track, but tracking fish throughout the food system is a very difficult thing to do. And so finding a sustain, if you're, if you're 
trying to opt for a sustainable version of, of seafood or a fish, this can be difficult to do because the tracking and the documentation can be very hard to to come to to to, to establish. Mm-hmm. So, like, well, I guess when I'm thinking about fish, there are there are definitely fish with distinctive flavors, right? So tuna, sure. right? Like, I think that would be hard to mask. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I think it's no probably it's easier. Than, I'm well I think it's my, easier than you yeah. might think. I think that, um, and again, I, I don't have the study in front of me or anything, but I know that there have been a couple instances of, of studies that have been done, and people mm-hmm. are buying. Oftentimes, fish that are are being sold are you know, a cheaper version of what they're advertised to be. Yeah, it's like you want you go and buy you want to buy a halibut, so you go buy a halibut, but it's actually tilapia, <laughs> right? Or, or cod. Or I mean, I don't know if that's the exact example, yeah. but it's I don't know either. Lines, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, I do have like um. So somebody, so I used to be vegetarian for a long time, um, and so I would eat a lot of like imitation sort of you know whatever, um, you know like tuna fish sandwich, quote unquote tuna fish sandwich, um, really? and somebody told me once that and th- maybe there's a nugget of truth in there. But somebody told me once that the way that they make it taste like fish, even though it's, you know, soy product or some whatever it is, um, is that they actually just put seaweed in it. And that, you know, that comes with sort of this really what we identify as like seafood, ocean food in particular, is the taste of the sea. And seaweed actually gets uh, very close to that. (laughs) That might be the case. There's something, you know, crab with a K. Are you familiar Mm -hmm. with crab with a K? No, no, not crab with a K, yeah. Imitation mm-hmm. crab, right? Okay. And so, yeah. Um, and this is actually not made. It's called surimi in Japan, and it's mm-hmm. it's a known quantity. It's a known thing in Japan, but usually it's marketed as crab with a K in the United States, and it's given some coloring so that's the red coloring on one side to make mm-hmm. it appear to be crab. And this is this is it's not seaweed. It's fish, mm-hmm. but it's it's more of a bottom feeder kind of thing. It's not quite the quality of of creature that people would be thinking of when they're paying for crab. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, you know, that's part of the imitation. But the, again, a lot of what we're talking about is, is what happens in the United States is distinct from what happens in other places mm-hmm. in the world as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's something else I wanted to raise with terminology. And, you know, I've taught about some of this stuff for a number of years. World population food supply is one of the classes that I've been teaching for a long time. Mm-hmm. And as I was researching these kinds of topics in the past, I noticed a terminology that used to be used that I think is used less now and is is starting to to, to go by the wayside. But these are the words that have been used to describe fish uh, stocks, Mm -hmm. populations of fish. Uh, Exploited, Mm -hmm. Mm overexploited, fully exploited, moderately exploited, and (laughs) underexploited. And and the idea of (laughs) underexploitation exploitation is, is very interesting that the fact that the idea that we're not exploiting enough this particular yeah. fish and that we could exploit more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the reason why these terms aren't used anymore. But for a long time, these are the ways that we described the enterprise of, of pulling fish from the sea is in is how much exploitation went on. Now, now instead of overexploited, I think the term overfished is used more mm-hmm. in turn of in turn and in, 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 instead of fully exploited, it's maximally sustained or fully fished. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then underexploited would be underutilized or underfished. So we're using a different kind of terminology that relates a little bit more to sustainability or unsustainability, mm-hmm. but it's kind of revealing the way that particularly in the past, we've talked about these things as if this were just the natural purview of people to go and take advantage of these things. Uh, and it's very curious to hear those kinds of terminology, that kind of terminology used. Yeah, well, and so if I if I just think of, you know, taking leaving the fish context, leaving the ocean context a little bit, if I just think of the word, you know, exploit, um, right, that to me, that is I, that has a negative connotation in my head. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's I just so. I would hope so. Right. Yeah, yeah. OK. Maybe I was maybe it's just my generation. Maybe it's, you know, um, you know sort of the, the world that we live in these days, maybe, you know, if, if I was born in 1940s, like, yeah, I'd be like, exploit everything because that's sort of the natural way of the world. Um, but I guess what I was getting at was that... Um, no offense to in, people born in the 1940s. Yeah, no, no offense to anybody. <laughs> but but I, I think I think where I'm going with this is that, um, to me, that 
the phrasing of that word and sort of maybe the era that it comes from is sort of the natural progression that um, capitalism as a economic theory was at the time where it's you are either over exploiting where you are going to cost your business money um, because you're you're not going to have that resource any longer yeah. um, or you are under exploiting. Therefore, you're not na- making as much money as you possibly could have. And both of those things are equally bad. And so you need to right. find that perfect sweet spot of perfect maximum, maximum exploitation, maximum or, or, exploitation yeah. where you are going. Yeah. Um, and I think I that's think right. Very it probably comes yeah. from that kind of that mm-hmm. framework, right? That yeah. idea. And it's very much uh, the, the economic system that we call mm-hmm. capitalism that encourages that kind of thought. I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, I not that like I'm a raging capitalist because I'm not, but you know, it is there, you know, I, I like to be able to buy things and, you know, I, I live in a world that is capitalist run. Um, but I think these terminal, this terminology of exploitation and under exploitation, over exploitation, all this stuff, I think comes from an era of certainly that predates the term sustainability, <laughs> um, which started filtering in the line of the OOs, um, you know, or maybe in the 1990s when people were like, well, maybe we should think about how to sustain things and not just run them into the ground. <laughs> no, I think this this is a good part of uh, of our conversation here. That that's the mentality that that I think people are trying to bring to mm-hmm. fisheries in general. Right. This is an important resource. Again, is one of these loaded terms, but this is mm-hmm. important food source. Uh, but if we abuse it, if we don't respect it, mm-hmm. then it won't be a food source any longer. Yeah. So we have to keep. We have to we have to keep it in, in such a way where we're not depleting things so much that they can't restore themselves, mm-hmm. and that we can continue to feed people with this. Right, and like, and to even go beyond, like, it's important as a food source, right? I think we've already established, and maybe we'll establish it again, um, that you know a lot of people depend on seafood, um, but fish are just they're natural, just like. And I'm gonna I'm gonna pull in the uh, a comparison with wolves, right? And fish and wolves are not all that similar, but I think there's definitely a comparison to use. But um, wolves were basically almost driven to extinction within the United States, um, you know, between you know late 1800s to um, you know whatever 1950 or something like that. Um, and as we found that when wolves were no longer available, um, there was knock-on effects to the environment. Right. When you when you remove a species from an ecosystem, there are yeah. unintended consequences. That unintended consequences. And and even like wolves weren't gone, but they were just mostly gone. Um, and that had that that had ramifications that we just we didn't even think were a thing. So I think the same thing applies to fish where, you know, even if even though they're very important as food, as a food source, there's if there were if there was a greatly depleted uh, uh, amount of fish in the ocean, there is absolutely knock on effects that um, maybe some scientists are thinking about, but most people probably don't know about no, or, absolutely. or think about. And, and yeah. we can, you know, we'll approach some of these things, I think, right. a little bit lo- longer uh, ahead in the, in the podcast here. But uh, absolutely. And there's, you know, looking at uh, an animal or creatures from a completely anthropocentric sort of food Mm -hmm. Uh, centered food supply perspective but there's also looking at them from other ethical perspectives on the behalf of the natural environment itself on Mm -hmm. behalf of species themselves um and these are other considerations that are more on the table today perhaps than they have been in the past Mm -hmm. two more definitions two more definitions really quick let me get this out fish stock because we've used it a number of times is a species that gets caught or harvested so that's what a fish stock is okay and then collapse, because we've also used that, and that's in the title of our, our <laughs> broadcast today, is when a species reaches a number from which a population cannot recover. So, so that's yeah. Is. Okay. Yeah. So that doesn't mean they're all completely gone, but they're on their way out. Is what that yeah. Means. It's certainly not viable uh, for, for harvesting for a food supply at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, let's move on because um, we've, I think we've, We've been talking a lot about sort of just setting. I think we we were on the definition section for quite a while. Um, to be fair, I did keep interrupting with thoughts and ideas that are probably alluding to where we're going. <laughs> well, I think it's important that we have our terminology down and we know yeah, what we're talking totally. about. And mm-hmm. 
But let's talk a bit some about some of the uses of seafood. Now, of course, most fish that are caught becomes food for people. Mm-hmm. But a small percentage, about 12%, is destined for non-food uses or non-humid consumption, at least. So these are largely coming in the form of fish meal, mm-hmm. which is much of it is used to feed pigs, poultry, and farmed fish. And fish oil, which in addition to a dietary supplement for people, is also used to feed farm animals and aquaculture. So it's interesting that most of the fish that is that is captured is used for human consumption, but some of it is used to feed other animals that people eat, and, and in particular, farmed fish. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit foreshadowing that if the fisheries collapse, that one of the major sources for sustaining aquaculture would also be compromised as well. So I guess basically we wouldn't be able to feed our own fish if we... <laughs> If we don't have fish to feed them. There's fish. other sources that of food, yeah. soy derived and other things mm-hmm. as well that can be uh, fed to, it depends on the species as well. But, you know, a lot of times people would think, oh, well, the answer would be aquaculture, but aquaculture right. would be uh, compromised in some way uh, if wild fish weren't available to be caught. Either. Mm-hmm. So in terms of production, because we're going to start talking about the geography things here a little bit more. Uh, there are certain countries that are, are pretty dominant in global fish production, and China heads that list. China accounts for some 35% right. of global fish production, and this includes aquaculture in this case. Mm-hmm. And this is a statistic that runs uh, that comes from 2018. Uh, now, outside of China, a significant share of production uh, in 2018 came from Asia, which is 34%. It's outside of China, followed by the Americas, 14%, Europe, 10%, Africa, 7%, and Oceania, 1%. Mm-hmm. So that gives you a rough idea of, by world region, what's happening in terms of global fish production. The top seven producing countries of global capture fisheries account for almost half of the total captures. So there's a small number of countries that are doing really a disproportionate amount of, of capturing of, of seafood and of fish. Mm-hmm. China producing 25, I'm sorry, 15% of the total, followed by Indonesia, 7%, Peru, 7%, and a lot of that is anchovy, India, 6%, and the Russian Federation, 5%, followed by the United States and Vietnam. And so the top 20 producing countries accounted for about 74% of the total capture of fisheries. So there's a small, relatively small group of countries that were res- responsible for a fairly large amount of the fish that are captured globally. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and really quick, I just want to geography check, um, really quick. Cause you mentioned Oceania, um, yeah. and that's a, that's a fun geography, uh, word, but I think, um, and I think rightfully, um, for the continent of basically that whole region that we would more commonly maybe in grade school have learned as Australia, the continent. Right. So Australia would be the largest <laughs> yeah. land mass involved in mm-hmm. Oceania. New Zealand would be part of that. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of Pacific islands, Polynesia, for example, would usually also be included in that particular region. Right. Um, yeah. And I think, um, well, so we're talking a lot about China right now. Um, is this the point where we're going to talk about China's fishing fleets? <laughs> because well, we could. Part. We, you could yeah. talk about it right here if we'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, so in doing my research um, and sort of how I, I came upon this topic in the first place was um, there was an article about the uh, the enormity of China's fishing fleets. And I can't remember the exact sentence I used um, inside my episode or, or the exact sentence I was in the article, which basically I was pulling it from one to the other. Um, but it was that China's um uh, external fishing fleets, so not not as fishing fleets within its own ec- uh, exclusive economic zones, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, but its external uh, fishing fleets were larger than basically any other country's fishing fleets at large, right? So if we're looking at the U.S. The fishing case. fleets, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So so China is going out into international waters and um, pulling out an enormous amount of fish. And the way that they're they've been able to do this is um, not just through a sheer enormity of fishes, uh, sorry, of fishing boats, um, but through the technology that we've been able to create over the last 70, 80 years, predominantly around um, propulsion and refrigeration. 
without yeah. refrigeration, this wouldn't be possible. So this would not be possible. Right. So what would happen is, you know, if you have, let's say 300 fishing boats that are uh, fishing off the, the exclusive economic zone of um, South America, which has been a hot spot over the last decade or so, um, there'll be a single or not a single, but multiple uh, uh, container vessels, for lack of a better word, that will just ferry directly from the fishing fleet to China mainland and back and forth. And so that fishing fleet almost lives outside of South America and just keeps collecting fish. And then it's like a shuttle or something. Just shuttles. Yeah, it's a, it's a shuttle system and unloads them onto the, the container vessel. The container vessel goes back to China and then unloads it there and it immediately goes back. And it's just this really efficient, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, efficient way of fishing <laughs> absolutely and 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 doing so non-stop in other words as well mm -hmm. so you don't right, have to doing really so. pause the fishing fleet itself doesn't have to come into port because it's mm -hmm. got this larger ship that's got these refrigerated units that everything is hauled upon and then brought back to a major port yeah and there was a quote in i think it was an article in the new york times about the fishing fleets um but it said that through satellite imagery you could you could map the border of Ecuador's uh, exclusive economic zone by where Chinese fishing fleets were. were. That's fascinating. You could like yeah. see the border because um, they were that's how close they were hugging to it. Um, and just so so people know, you know, I keep I keep mentioning exclusive economic zone, um, and I think we've talked about this again in a previous episode, but um, that is merely the zone that you know it's not really. I guess you don't have um, territorial claim necessary, but but you have well, economic ex claim. That's exactly right. So 12 nautical miles away from the shoreline of a particular country is the territory of that country. All the law laws apply. Mm -hmm. But from 12 miles to 200 miles is considered right. the exclusive economic zone. And the country that has that, that is, is, has 12 to 200 miles from their shore has the exclusive right, according to the law of the sea, uh, to harvest fish, uh, to harvest oil, uh, mm -hmm. resources of this variety. And so, you know, the, what you're describing here is that you have a particular country that is stationing its fleet right up into what is essentially the border of an economic mm -hmm. exclusive zone. And, um, you know, another thing would be going into the, the EEZ of another country. And that's something mm -hmm. that probably happens as well. But yeah. when we're talking about international waters, we're talking basically about a commons, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's the tragedy of the commons, <laughs> which is the idea that, well, if I don't take more than my fair share, somebody else will. So I might mm -hmm. as well take as much as I possibly can. And the commons is a term that relates to feudalism. And the end of the commons came with, well, with ca capitalism in terms of land. Mm -hmm. uh, but there still is a commons out in the open seas, international waters. But we're starting to see what some of the pressures there are. Ex exclusive economic zone um, is not, well, I guess for lack of a better word, it's um, it's not, if somebody fishes in that, it's not necessarily illegal, right? Well, it does break an international convention that's supposed to be the purview of a particular country out into 200 miles. There's some countries who would like to observe the continental shelf as the border. Mm -hmm. um yeah. but uh technically it's 200 nautical miles away from the, the border of a particular country right the coastline of a particular country yeah um so i just realized we've been talking for a while um and we've missed something very important for our <laughs> for our needs um which is um an ad break <laughs> let's take an ad break let's let's take an ad break so um uh, Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And I don't know how long ads go on for these days. Um, 60 seconds, I think, maybe something It'll like that. It'll be fast. It'll, It'll be, be fast. fast. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Ads. And we're back uh, talking about fish and fish stocks and economic zones and how exclusive they are or not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk a little bit about some of the countries that export and import the most, since we're talking about some of the geography of this stuff. I, we've been talking about China a little bit. China has been the major exporter of fish since 2002. Mm -hmm. 
Norway has been number two on that list. So that's number two on the uh, primary exporting since 2004. Vietnam is uh, third on that list since 2014, and that's followed by India and Thailand. So these are the countries that are primarily exporting a lot. Mm -hmm. In terms of imports, in 2018, the 27 countries of the European Union was the largest fish importing market, 34% in terms of value followed by the U.S. and Japan. Mm -hmm. However, that's 27 different countries. So the U.S. is, in fact, the largest world's importer of fish. And of the fish that are consumed in the United States, the United States imports about 90% of that. So it's Mm -hmm. pretty dependent on foreign markets, on on international, the international scene to bring in a lot of its fish and seafood. Which is, well, one, I mean, so I guess I have two comments here. So uh, the first is that uh, of the top five um, countries, like four of them were basically Southeast Asia or I guess in plus India. But, you know, right. it kind of runs into that as well, um, that area. And, and I do remember looking at a map from um, I can't remember the organ- organization's name, but some ocean based organization or some org- organization that's focused on the ocean. Um, and I do remember seeing a map that showed sort of fishery degradation and mm-hmm. Southeast Asia lit up like a beacon um, in terms of they don't, they are overfishing um, to the point where it's, it's a very, very rough state right now. And that's, I think that's partly why China sends its fleets at, you know, elsewhere. It's a, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a combination of, of fish that are captured for export and then also fish that are, uh, captured for consumption as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, and so I, I think going back, so I think four of the f- top five, Norway is a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, just considering, you know, I mean, I guess they do have a large coastline up there. Um, I guess I just don't, I, I don't really necessarily associate Norway with fishing. Maybe that's just the, the thing. <laughs> um, no, I think that I mean, that's a big part of the culture. I think it's a big part of the diet there, but it's also a big industry as well. Mm-hmm. There are certain countries where, and we've talked about early at the at the top of the podcast, that 17% of the global population of intake of, uh, intake of animal proteins come from fish. But there are certain places that are disproportionately dependent on fish as a protein. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there are certain countries which 50% or more of protein comes from fish, and they include Bangladesh, Cambodia, the Gambia. Ghana, mm-hmm. Indonesia, Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, and then several small island states uh, in the Pacific. So mm-hmm. these are some of the places that uh, if there was a collapse of fisheries would be disproportionately affected because they're that much more dependent upon fish for the diet of their people than other places. Yeah. And I, and I, so I actually remember this from my episode. Um, and so all of those countries, you know, if, if, if fish were, you know, much more expensive or just much harder to get overall. There just wasn't enough fish to go around. Um, obviously yeah. there would be, you know, knock on effects around sort of feeding their people. Um, and I do remember also not to just keep coming back to China, but um, I'm going to use China because it's 1.4 billion people. Um, I do recall about 25% of their protein comes from seafood, um, which again, maybe it's not a majority, but when you take 25% of a you know, protein source from 1.4 billion people, which is um, a sizable percentage of the of the planet. Really. That's that's a sizable percentage of the planet that has a huge ramification for, um, I guess just just where people are. How how are people going to replace that? And and I and again, I talked about this um, a little bit, but you know, I think the easy answer is you know a lot of people like to assume like, well, we can replace it with plant based sources, uh, but there are complications with that. You know, that's you don't. Right. You can't just fill up with beans, for example. Um, well, there's all kinds of pressures right? on on agriculture that's happening yeah. on the land, which is sure to be a future episode mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, but having the arable land is heavily taxed already, so to have to yeah. be even more dependent on the land uh, that's producing agriculture mm-hmm. to produce even more comes with all kinds of pro problems associated with it. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been talking a lot about the oceans and we should take a moment to to turn inward a little bit to what are called inland waters. So fishing that happens uh, within the territory of a particular country and waters, fresh waters, yeah. largely 
and it's, it's that, close that to home for us. <laughs> that's right. That, that hits close close to home for right. us. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. exactly right. Now globally, twelve point five percent of total fish uh, captures, uh, fishery capture production comes from inland waters. So that's not that much compared to what's coming from the ocean. So if we talk mm-hmm. about a collapse of what's happening in the oceans, it's pretty significant. Inland catch is particularly important in two parts of the world. The first being Asia, which accounts for 60%, 64% of the world total. And then Africa, 28%. So if you add those together, that's really most of what's happening. So although it can be important to lots of different groups, lots of different cultures in other parts mm-hmm. of the world, if we're talking about sheer number, mm-hmm. percentage, uh, Asia and Africa are the places that depend disproportionately on inland catch. Yeah. And that would be, um, again, so I, when we're talking about inland catch, we, you know, for those of us here in the United States and Pacific Northwest specifically, um, salmon, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, or steelhead or, or whatever, freshwater fish. Um, I'm not a fisher person. Well, these are fish. <laughs> of course, salmon are the fish that go that go to the ocean and come back mm-hmm. and, and come spawn back, yeah. in mm-hmm. fresh water. So they're kind of a special case. Uh, although many of them, I, I'm not sure what the percentage is, they can be caught in, in the ocean. They can be caught inland as well. Mm. But gotcha. again, it, and that's a major economic source and a major tradition for uh, first peoples and native peoples, mm-hmm. uh, certainly in, in North America. But if we're talking globally, uh, it's not doesn't quite reach that percentage as some of the other places in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's a statistic on aquaculture I found uh, very interesting when I was doing my research. Aquaculture uh, aquaculture accounted for some 40%, 46% of the total production of fisheries and 52% of global consumption. So over half of the food, you know, that's consumed uh, through fish, you know, through through fish and seafood is actually consumed from aquaculture. So it's, mm-hmm. it's over half now, a little bit less than half, which means that there's a disproportionate amount of fish oil and fish meal, for example, mm-hmm. that are these non-human uh, uh, destination sort of sources. But aquaculture has, has really become, and if you look at a chart of this, it's become increasingly more important. And that trend seems to be something that's going to continue. Yeah, well... I guess that kind of makes sense, right? If we're overfishing non-aquaculture, then the I think the natural method of capitalism, just like I guess again, not to use land-based animals necessarily as my only example, but I'm going to go back to them. It's right, a, it's a good comparison. Yeah. Good comparison, right? It's it becomes efficient and profitable to farm and grow and contain and exploit your own sort of naturally replenishing cycle um, right. rather than having to you know go out and hunt um wild animals and of course we did that having right a captive having a captive supply having not yeah. domesticated but a captive supply mm-hmm. and of course you know we did that and, and I, maybe a good parallel here is the american bison the buffalo um which That's was right. wild and you know we over exploited it <laughs> to go back to it uh, an old world uh, uh, a word that we used earlier in this episode um over exploited it basically you know it it was you know over buffaloed <laughs> um well a lot of the story of the bison has to do with the desire one to eliminate a food source for native americans so that's mm-hmm. part of the very nefarious history that goes along with that mm-hmm. and a lot of the bison uh that were that were slaughtered basically and that, that's exactly what was happening because they weren't all used for food or skins mm-hmm. or anything always that land that used to be occupied by bison were then occupied as rangelands by longhorn cattle that were driven up um, from Texas up throughout the Western United States. So there was a very specific plan uh, for, for for that. So the, there's some analogies there, but there's mm-hmm. sort of another layer of complication when we're talking about that. Yeah. Well, I just think the point, the, the I guess, all true. My, the, just my point being is that um, there are ways that we can you know that we historically have intentionally or non-intentionally we have driven a wild species to um, basically collapse um, to the point where we have to we are forced to or we are intentionally forcing people to rely on 
you know, factory farmed aquaculture, what what have you, right? This is not a new concept, sort of where we're at today with seafood. That, that's right. So let's talk about collapse. Let's talk about why fisheries are collapsing. And we'll talk about overfishing. And, and overfishing is when fish are caught faster than stocks can replenish themselves. And there are at least three different ways to think about overfishing. There's growth overfishing, which is catch, catching too many juvenile fish, too many small mm-hmm. fish that then can't re- reproduce and, and replenish the stocks. There's recruitment overfishing, which is when too many adult fish are captured and stocks can't replenish. Mm-hmm. And then there's a third category, ecosystem overfishing, which is when an ecosystem is altered due to overfishing, mm. uh, which further contributes to uh, inability of these stocks to recover. So for that, the last one, when um, ecosystems are altered due to uh, uh, overfishing, uh, I guess, can we dive into that a little bit more? Not to, not to use yeah. a pun here. Um, Too late. I, w- what does that mean? So like, I guess the way I'm thinking of it um, is that you take out too much fish and therefore you're altering the ecosystem and therefore it's no longer able to sustain or basically everything. Well, that's, maybe. that's, that's one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Another thing is maybe we can start talking a little bit also about how fish are caught. Mm-hmm. And so there's oh, a yeah. couple of distinct ways of fishing that is particularly disruptive to mm-hmm. uh, aquatic environments. Uh, one of those is a bottom trawling, which is when a net is weighed down and dragged across the ocean floor. Uh, there's an issue with bycatch with that, but also the greater issue perhaps is that this technique contributes to an enormous amount of habitat damage. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Makes similar sense. to that is dredging and dredging yeah. is, is similar to bottom trawling, but instead of a net, it's a metal sort of rake or cage that is used to collect species who live in the floor, in the floor of the ocean. Mm-hmm. And habitat destruction is a huge concern with this as well. Uh, and so, you know, these are some of the ways beyond fishing itself in which natural environments are are destroyed. There's also, you know, the adding of fossil fuel. There's there's the fossil fuel situation, right, which is mm-hmm. consuming a lot of fossil fuels in order to practice aquaculture. And the two I named are particularly demanding of fossil fuels. But then there's there's pollution that goes into the oceans as well, which is also an aspect of change of ecosystems. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a combination of these things that relate to ecosystem overfishing as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, certainly overfishing. We talked earlier about how you remove part of a species from uh, an, an ecosystem and all of a sudden there's all kinds of knockout effects. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, larger fish uh, or, or larger aquatic species don't have a food source either. Mm-hmm. And they're they start to plummet in their their numbers, and then the roles that they play in the ecosystem are compromised, mm-hmm. and we have ecosystem change because of that as well. So overfishing contribute to that as well. Yeah, and I think a good uh, maybe analogy is because we all learned this in grade school, at least those of us in America, and you know a lot of probably a lot of you know countries actually, uh, but the concept of the food chain, right? Um, you know, you have the small fish that's fed on by the bigger fish, which fed on the bigger fish and right. the shark and then the whale and you know, whatever, right? It's just sort of like moves up. And then if you, you know, take one of, you know, if you dredge out the middle section of that. Or any section. Or any yeah. section of that, then the whole thing sort of falls, right? And there's all of a sudden there's, you know, collapse on multiple ends um, that just causes like a ripple effect of degradation. Um, and I think that's a huge part of the importance of why we, we don't want to um, overfish is that, and especially with these methods that you described, the, um, and I don't remember what the, the first one was called, um, but dredging, bottom trawling, yeah, bottom bottom trawling, trawling. Yep. where you're, you're basically just pulling everything and anything out that you sort of run across in sort of a large swath. Um, and I think you mentioned a key word there, which was bycatch. And I'm assuming that means things that you're not intending to catch, but it's you're just catching because that's right. You're getting everything. Yeah. So uh, bycatch is when animals that are not targeting by uh, by the fishing industry are ensnared and captured by fishers. So this can be dolphins, turtles, sharks, mm-hmm. whales, rays, juvenile fish, young fish, fish caught out of season, season and birds as well. Mm-hmm. And so there's a high mortality rate for many species that are caught in bycatch, which is bad for the species. It's bad for ecosystems as well. 
There's also the loss of biodiversity that is coming from all of this that we're talking about. So we're talking mm-hmm. about the loss of biodiversity as well. And there's a term that's called fishing down. Fishing down relates to this notion of fishing deeper into the ocean and further down into the food chain. Mm-hmm. It usually involves catching smaller species of fish, including sardines and anchovy. And anchovy is one of the most fish species in the world today, particularly the Peruvian mm-hmm. anchovy. And uh, so these species often form parts of larger species diets. And so this is, this is, can be a problem where we're, we're, we're decimating part of a food chain or part of an ecosystem that has effects that will be felt way beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. And I think, um, so in terms of bycatch, you know, we're talking you know, you, you mentioned dolphins briefly, and I think, again, um, what I most associate that with is, you know, you go to the grocery store and you you want to buy some tuna and you look at a thing and it says it's dolphin safe, right? Um, which I don't know how actually dolphin safe a lot of those things are. I don't know what the, there's always qualifiers there about like what it, it actually probably means it was caught with a method that is not associated with a lot of bycatch. Mm-hmm. Okay. So one of one of the methods of fishing that is associated with a lot of bycatch is called long lines. This is a form of line fishing mm-hmm. where you have hooks on uh, where line is is deposited over into the ocean over miles. Mm-hmm. The average length of long lines for US fishers, and I don't know what it's out in other places, is 28 miles, but long lines can be over 60 miles long. Wow. And the bycatch can can vary, um, but it can be very damaging. And this is, is such a damaging form of fishing that it's been made illegal in certain areas. It's been banned, for example, I think, um, in California, although that mm. was rolled back under a certain presidency that happened recently. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm not sure if they've recovered from that. But it seemed to be so deleterious to uh, other species that that it's not one of the the methods that's that's uh, that's that's deemed to be sustainable. Mm-hmm. Well, line fishing is individual fishing lines, and there are much fewer issues involved with bycatch. But of course, that's a much more labor intensive way of fishing. Right. I mean, it makes sense, right? If you're if you're dropping sixty miles worth of net, and then anything. And that 60 miles just comes rum. Well, well, these would be lines. These are lines with hooks on them. But there are what you're talking about, which is person fishing, which Mm. is large nets that are used to surround entire Uh, species of fish. And then that is pulled up and like pulled tight with like a drawstring would be on a Mm. bag. Yeah. And there's issues with bycatch, particularly with sharks and turtles. Mm. And so there are net fishing which um, can be associated with this. And this is, I think, one of the dominant forms of fishing worldwide in terms mm-hmm. of not individual fishers, but in terms of uh, if we were to look at the amount of tonnage that is caught, this mm-hmm. would be the dominant methods as person. Sort of like factory fishing. That's right. a better yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. yeah. I guess that's what I was. I, so, okay. Yeah. You're right. I was thinking about that when you were, when you were talking about sort of 60 miles um, because, you know, you sort of can just pull in so much stuff and lift it up and just, drop it into your boat um or maybe that's a certain cartoon image i have in my no head. that's basically what can happen and right. then a lot of bycatch is thrown back into the sea but it's too late for a lot of mm-hmm. these creatures that are caught this way um and so even if there are efforts made to to try to, to throw back the catch mm-hmm. it's not intended that doesn't always work out that way um if we're talking about fisheries collapsing The estimates that I've seen suggest that approximately 35% of fish stocks today are overfished. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, a third, a little bit more than a third. In 1974, that figure was 10%. Mm -hmm. So not in your lifetime, but in my lifetime, (laughs) (laughs) uh, that number has, has more than tripled. And so that's disturbing, right? Because I mean, I'm not that old, right? In my lifetime, right. I'm talking about here, the number of fisheries that have collapsed has increased by by, by times three. Uh, approximately 60%, which suggests are of a sustainable level. Mm-hmm. And then there's the 
underexploited, which we're now calling underfish, which is approximately 7%. So, and these are targeted fish species that are, you know, fisheries are that, that, that fishers are after. Mm-hmm. So a third are considered to be in collapse. Now, a collapsed species can recover, but it requires an enormous amount of cooperation and management in order for that to happen. So mm-hmm. There's no guarantee that a collapsed population can recover. Uh, and I think in many cases, that's it's unrealistic to expect that. And I guess on that, are, are, on that note, are we, when we're talking about collapsed fisheries, are we talking about international waters or is anybody monitoring that? I'm, I guess, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about sort of the middle of the Pacific ocean, obviously the largest ocean in, in, in the world, um, do we know what's happening out there or is it sort of, we don't know. And you and I don't know, sir. We don't know. <laughs> apparently, apparently somebody knows. And okay. I think that, you know, there's certain nonprofit organizations, there's the United Nations that are monitoring mm. this and how those estimates are come up with, you yeah. know, how they come up with these things and how they can estimate uh, if a species is close to collapse or not. Mm. Something a little bit beyond what I, I've done research on. Uh, but apparently there's a way to, to ascertain this. And a lot of it's based on estimation, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a guideline, and management is a really key way of of trying to mitigate um, the collapses from happening. But of course, the reason that's so difficult is what you just mentioned is international waters mm-hmm. where there are no laws, and right. there is the law of the sea, which the United Nations administers. But you know, some of the most you know we mentioned one of the most powerful. Uh, you know, commercial fleets in the world comes from China. That's on a security council. Mm-hmm. You have some very powerful countries that uh, are have disproportionate power in the United Nations, and so mm-hmm. um, that probably pays a, plays into this as well. There's also illegal fishing, which makes it really hard for managers to estimate what's going on, and that complicates things as as, as well. For high value species, apparently up to thirty percent of catch are thought to be caught illegally. And the, one of the problems with the illegal cats, catches is that they're un, not only unregulated, but they're unreported. And so I think it's the one of the ways I think we can try to answer our question here is that there are some regulations that when a ship comes into port, they have to report what, they, what they've caught. And gotcha. this helps mm-hmm. managers estimate where they're at and their ability to gauge whether a particular fish stock is being overfished or whether it's at a somewhat sustainable level. So mm-hmm. when things are caught illegally, it's very hard to track those things. That makes mm-hmm. it really hard to manage fisheries, which is a strange thing to say to manage a wild species, but but that's kind of what it what's at stake here. Right. Is that human intervention has to be at play here to limit other humans from <laughs> overfishing. Mm-hmm. So I think um with that um, I think we're starting to head into um, some what if scenarios and some, you know, yeah, we'll we'll just leave it at that. Some what if scenarios, um, but before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna be good this time. Um, guess what? Yep. <laughs> guess what? It's uh, it's time to run some ads. Um, so if you could please um, just go buy some. Pro- well, you actually, you just have to listen to it. I don't. Whatever. Listen to some of these ads. Here we go. Welcome back. Uh, we are about to head into our what if section of the podcast the whole the whole uh, crux of this this podcast um and so um but before we do that let me just let me just say one thing about absolutely the role of climate change in all of this absolutely i mean right. we have unlimited time so that's right <laughs> so uh i will say that rising water temperatures and acidification are two of the primary mechanisms by which climate change is is impacting aquatic life and affecting uh, fish stocks as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, as there always is, there's a geography to this. So there's certain countries, certain states that are more at risk from having their 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 catch affected by potential changes in climate change. Um, and these are largely located in tropical coastal regions of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and also some of the smaller island uh, states in the Pacific. So Benin, uh, 
Kiribati, Liberia, mm-hmm. Mauritania, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, the Solomon Islands and Togo are apparently some of the places that are particularly at risk from uh, from having fish stocks affected by climate change, you know, to a disproportionate mm-hmm. amount. Outside of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and the Pacific, Cambodia and Haiti are also uh, considered to be at a, at a fairly high risk here. And it's not that other places aren't, but these are some of the places that are somewhat dependent on, on fish stocks for, for nutrition, for food supply, for protein, and will be vulnerable uh, if climate change continues to have a, a large impact. Yeah. And I think just maybe just tracking back to what we were talking about earlier in this episode about Alaska, um, again, very cog or very, very recent um, event um, where, you know, snow crabs have basically disappeared from, you know, I don't know if ever, if, if anybody who's listening to this has ever watched that, uh, I don't know, National Geographic show or discovery show or whatever is about um, crab crabbers up in Alaska. You know, deadliest, deadliest catch. catch. Deadliest yeah. catch. There you go. Yep. Um, so those are the people, right? That those are the people who, um, who who have been you know out there and sort of like hauling in all these crabs and making their you know money out of that. And this year, you know, the snow crabs basically the the season just didn't exist. Um, and it's not because of overfishing necessarily, but it's because of what you're talking about. It's because of climate change, uh, ocean acidification, and ocean temperature warming. Right? You know, we like to think of temperatures inside how we think of it as being you know, right. warm or cold um crabs have a much different scale and for them it's already you know hitting that point where it's not livable yeah or small not, not sustainable. Of, mm-hmm. a small amount of change in water temperature can mm-hmm. have a huge impact for species yeah um, and, and now we're starting to get into some of the problems and, and the what if scenarios here right and Let's so do it. what if the f- you know, fisheries around the world collapse. And, you know, it's part of this is, is reaching back to some of the things we've talked about. But one of the things is that billions of people will be lacking a major <laughs> protein source, right? Yeah. And this would be a very big deal. Um, it would really threaten the the food security and the food sovereignty of, of many people throughout the world. Yeah. And I think, again, if you're listening to this, chances are you are, um, just by nature that we're speaking English, you are, um, you're you're potentially you're probably in the U.S. You could be Canadian. You could be you know broadly European. Um, maybe there's some other areas. Um, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that um, if you go to, for example, Japan, um, just how much seafood is within their sort of natural sort of um, natural, but you know within their restaurants within their diets is they're, they're, they're far higher. Diets are much more dependent on. Mm-hmm on fish and seafood in many places in the world outside of Europe and the Americas. Certainly. Right. So whereas, you know, chicken, you know, might be a good, you know, you know, comparison for the U S you know, chicken, you know, we like to say chickens and everything in the U S and to chicken has that. outstripped beef now as a major food mm-hmm. source in terms of animal protein. And this happened re- really in the last 10 years or so, but that's mm-hmm. exactly the case. Yep. Yeah. And so it would be like, okay, all that chicken that's out there, you, you know, and sandwiches and all this kind of stuff. Um, if that was no longer able to be sustained, that would be sort of an equivalent um, comparison to what would happen in a country like Japan or uh, the Gambia or uh, Sri Lanka that are heavily dependent on um, on fish. Right. That's right. Well, and, and really connected to that, in, in, in addition to losing a major protein source and a major source of, of calories and of diet, there would be the loss of livelihood for millions and millions of people uh, particularly for those involved in small-scale fishing operations. Mm-hmm. So not only is this a food source, but this is an economic source for many people in the world that would be eliminated or largely challenged, and that would have all kinds of, of ramifications as well. People would be having trouble supporting themselves, and they'd have to seek other ways to do that. Yeah, and if we, if you did listen to our episodes on what if there was no... Um... Uh, international borders. Uh, we talked a little bit about this idea of um, you know immigration and why people move. Um, primarily, it's due to economic means. So, um, fishing. That was the next thing on my list of, <laughs> there we of, go. of, of what well, if outcomes. Yeah. Well, possible migrations. Absolutely. There. Well, let's 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 launch into it because I think there's a big there's a big 
that, I mean, that's gonna be that's a big um, aspect of the what if scenario if there if, if fishing was was to go away. But I'm gonna you've done a lot more research here, so I'm gonna let you take it take it away. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that there's there's at least three different things that come to my mind when I'm thinking about the possible migrations that could emerge from the the collapse of fisheries. Mm-hmm. One of them is a more rural to urban migration, right? And mm-hmm. so people who are living in coastal cities uh, uh, that are you know, not large cities would have to move to maybe a place where they'd have to enter into wage labor and this kind of thing. So we'd Mm -hmm. see the continuing movement of people from more rural areas to urban areas. And having said that, of course, a lot of fishing operations and a lot of small scale ones do happen in in urban areas. There'd be a lot of migrations within a country, right? Mm -hmm. People would be seeking opportunity within a country, but then I have to believe that there'd be a lot of international migrations that would accompany Mm -hmm. this as well. And a lot of times when people we're living in places without a lot of economic opportunity are going to go to places where they perceive at least there to be more economic opportunity and, you know, yeah, revisit the, what happened if we don't have international borders in the world to review what some of those scenarios are. But I think that that could be definitely something that could be an outcome of the collapse of fisheries. Yeah. And I think, um, in particular, talking about the rural to urban migration, which is something we we've touched on again in, in, previous episodes. Um, but I think here, you know, maybe there's a, a specific point to make in that um, we've already gone through a huge shift uh, globally um, in terms of uh, rural to urban migration, right? I think um, sometime right. in the last few decades, we actually did flip into more than half the people on the planet now live in Demographers urban. tell us this happened around 99, 2000, right. but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Um, Actually, I don't know. Maybe I should turn on my geography and urban planning card here. Um, I actually don't know if that's started to slow down or, or if it's sort of been st- in, whether it's been stagnant or if it's speeding up or or what what have you. Um, the sense is it's only increased. I don't have hard increased. statistics on that. From based on what I've been sort of witnessing yeah. and my view of the world, that that has that has not mm-hmm. decreased. But I think the point that I was going to make is that if the if fisheries did collapse, that would precipitate more, as you already mentioned, more uh, rural to urban migration um, to the point where there's already cities, and I'm thinking of cities like Dhaka, Bangladesh, um, that are severely strained with tens of millions of people um, that simply are struggling to keep up with the mass amount of population they have. And so they would have to facilitate even more because now people who are subsisting on the ocean and fish um, now, again, like you had mentioned, have to turn to the only other economic engine that there is for them, which is something put, in the city. That put pressures on individuals, it put mm-hmm. pressure on groups, it put, puts pressure on governments, mm-hmm. and then it puts pressure on international organizations yeah. that are trying to address this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those issues would only be amplified. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if I'm doing yeah. a what if scenario, I think that that would be that would be worse. Yeah. And I, uh, I love cities. I, I mean, I'm a self, self-proclaimed self uh, urbanist. I love them. I think they're, you know, I, I enjoy living in one. I enjoy all of the, you know, the fruits of the cities that, that it has to offer. But there's also strains that there's, there are strains to what a city can um, provide. Yeah, and, absolutely. I mean, we have quite a bit of privilege attached to our mm-hmm. existence within exactly. cities. And mm-hmm. that's not the case for most people who live in cities globally. Exactly. So most people who live in globally, cities globally are going to find a lot of the negative aspects of cities be more a part of their daily reality probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, that's, that's a really great point is that cities as we typically experience them, even, you know, if you're living in sort of, you know, again, the U S you're living in the largest U S city, New York city, um, that is a pretty nice experience compared to a city that is struggling with keeping up with its population. And even within cities that are fairly affluent, there's quite mm-hmm. a geography of those who are living comfortably. Those, you know, there's those who are very wealthy. There's those mm-hmm. who are living comfortably. And then there are those who are not living comfortably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are the numbers that would continue to swell probably if mm-hmm. this scenario that we're trying to describe were to happen. And then there's another population of individuals throughout the world you know, indigenous people, uh, mm-hmm. you know, first people, uh, mm-hmm. people of Native Americans, for example, uh, many of whom depended on fish for millennia for uh, 
their diet, for their economics, for their spiritual and social life. And for that to be further compromised would be a further threat to these populations of people who've already um, been um, been put on uh, on the ropes. And mm-hmm. so this, this would be for populations like this that have already suffered so much, um, an extra blow, really. Right. And I think in, we they're not a population that certainly for here in the United States that we consult with in terms of how to better manage land and resources. Well, that's exactly right. We probably these should. Are, these are groups that have been disenfranchised from power, mm-hmm. and that's that may be different in different places. Although I think if we were to look throughout the world, we'd find that there are very few uh, groups that we're describing here as, as let's let's say indigenous groups who have the kind of political power and will or are consulted upon in order to um to ask you know what would be good for you what would be good for for your population and mm-hmm. certainly um the overfishing and the industrial scale that goes on is not something that's going to benefit these populations these mm-hmm. so these groups yeah Okay, well, so let's let's keep moving on with our what if scenarios here. What what's next? Well, uh, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but it would have a devastating impact on ecosystems, on aquatic species, mm-hmm. um, including those that are not sought by the fishing industries. Uh, so there would be these impacts on the food chain. You know, if we mm-hmm. have a collapse in sardines and anchovy, anchoveta, which is the Peruvian anchovy throughout, mm-hmm. um, you know, the coast of. of south america then we would find species aquatic species uh that haven't been so first of all some of them might start being sought by people because the other uh the others have collapsed and people's diets might start seeking that out but we would find uh some very dire circumstances for many species in in the oceans and then also perhaps in inland waters as well yeah, and I, I think you raised a, a really important point there, of, uh, and it definitely f- filters into the what if scenario here. Um, but if you know, if we sort of exhaust the supply of fish and seafood that we are normally attuned to catching, um, humans yes. by our very nature won't just you know say, okay, well we're not going to do that anymore. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to move up the food chain or down the food chain and start That's harvesting right. those. And so, right. So, you know, a return to, you know, let's, let's go after whales again. You know, obviously there's still some countries that do whaling, um, but, you know, open season again, because, you know, at a certain point people become desperate and they aren't going yeah, to. An yeah. inter- international convention that not every, the idea is today in the modern world, mm-hmm. whales are supposed to be, harvested, which is, you know, again, kind of a gruesome word for uh, academic mm-hmm. research, but there are certain countries that have been kind of mm-hmm. claiming they're doing that and that's not what's happening. You know, an early moment of early fishing that we can look at, particularly focused on on our own country in the United States, was in the early 1800s related to whales off the Cape, coast of Cape Cod. And so that mm-hmm. was sort of a foreshadowing what would happen. And I think that you're right, that we would start looking for other species that we could use to substitute uh, into our diet with those species that we've already over over consumed and, and mm-hmm. over caught. Which is, I mean, again, not to harp on capitalism, but it, it's a very capitalist way of of thinking about how we would adapt. And I think it's in a way it's very predictable. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's sort of naturally what how capitalism works. It's technically speaking, China mm-hmm. is not strictly it is a socialist country or communist right. country, not a mm-hmm. capitalist country. Although I think this is a pretty good moment. And I don't know if we've said this before, but there are probably very few countries that are strictly one or the other. Right. In the United States, there's all kinds of aspects of socialism <laughs> in our <laughs> economic system, although the United States is sort of the poster child for uh, for mm-hmm. capitalism. And if we were to look at places like China and, and other places that are running under communist or even socialist governments in other places, we would find elements of capitalism. So it's more of a continuum here. Mm-hmm. But certainly, um, economic systems, large economic systems and capitalism certainly have, have not been beneficial to uh, stocks of animals and, and populations and species. 
mm-hmm. uh, that are sought after by humans for food, because the idea of enough doesn't really come up in capitalism all that much. <laughs> More is always better. And so the idea of finding that sustainable limit has been yeah. really hard, I think, sometimes to integrate into the capitalist system because it's not really part of the structure of the economic system at its core. Um, yeah, and <laughs> without without detracting from our topic too much, I I I love the the sentence that the idea of enough is not something that really filters through capitalism um, really enough. Um, and I think there's there's a lot there um, to the point where it's pro- again it's probably another episode at some point filters in through there, um, but it's just not something that really any business is ever going to you know whether it's you know Microsoft or you know farming or whatever it doesn't matter the idea that there's a, there's not going to be enough profit or enough um, uh, supply um, I think really harps on sort of the issue at play here i think you could find examples and Mm -hmm. you could probably find examples i'm sure you could in a capitalist Mm -hmm. system where there are companies that that have adopted this philosophy Mm -hmm. but entire industries right would be harder to find Uh, there's a book by thomas princeton that was published in 2005 called the logic of sufficiency Mm -hmm. and it's a very interesting idea that you know, one of the things that we could think about is not is what is the most efficient way to harvest or to produce as many things as is possible, but what would be sufficient in order to be sustainable, both Mm -hmm. for whatever was being produced, and in this case, what animals are being caught, Mm -hmm. and also for the people who are making their livelihoods off of this, and, and also populations of people who depend on this for their diet. And that would be a different way of framing things. And that's Mm -hmm. not a very popular way of framing things necessarily, but it's something interesting for us to think about. Um, But if, so if we're talking about what if situations and we're talking about a lack of food supply for billions of people throughout the world, there's a couple different things that we can think about that might replace that. And one of that we've talked a bit about, which is the increased use of aquaculture itself. Mm -hmm. So that might be something, and we've seen aquaculture is on the rise, and it's now accounting for more than, technically accounting for more than half of the the animal protein, Mm. sorry, the the fish that are consumed Mm -hmm. are consumed through aquaculture. But as we also said before, there's the, the collapse of fish stocks would also compromise that to a certain degree because a lot of farm fish are dependent upon being fed fish that are caught in the wild. And so fish meal and fish oil that Mm -hmm. are derived from wild catch, um, we would have to use other foods, including grains and soy. And this points to another way, which another direction that people would probably have to look for would be increased agriculture, right? Increased Mm -hmm. agriculture on the land, which would be taxing the land that has already been pretty, pretty thoroughly taxed that would depend on that even further. And so we have to think about, so we might be thinking about scenarios now in which we could get land to be even more productive than it is. now. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, the green revolution, which is the it's set of innovations and in farming technologies that was, mm-hmm. that was developed in the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s around the staple grains of corn, of rice and wheat. And there've been some, benefits that have come with that, but there's also been a lot of critiques. Mm -hmm. And one of the critiques is that hasn't been particularly good for a lot of the poorest farmers in the world. So one of the knock-on effects of the collapse of uh, fish stocks and uh, fisheries and the increase in agriculture, the way the dominant agriculture in the world today in terms of profits is is industrialized agriculture. So Mm -hmm. if we were going to double down in industrialized agriculture, we'd be doubling down in the technologies that have led us to this point. And our hope that those technologies can continue to deliver us to a place where we could feed a lot of people. And indeed, a lot more grains have been produced, Mm -hmm. but at what cost to people's livelihoods, to people's cultural, you know, cultural um, traditions, to, to people's ability, farmers' abilities to control what they produce themselves. And so food security and then more important, 
importantly, in some ways, food sovereignty, I think, would be further threatened by this, this collapse in fisheries that would have all these knock-on effects we're talking. Yeah, and I think I think the thing that I, I think about as you were talking about um, sort of the Green Revolution and everything like that is, um, and I think this was maybe a bigger story a few years ago, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but there's this idea of um, sort of, uh, uh, I think it was Monsanto who had developed a specific kind of um, seed that was, you know, a genetically modified, you know, organism or whatever, um, and people were growing it, and then those seeds would then fly into somebody else's, you know, plot of land, and therefore, you know, would start growing there, and then that, then there was like all these legal issues around sort of what that meant for those farmers and how they could use that and or not use that and, or whether farmers could even use the seeds that were coming out of their own plants to then replant right there's right. all these different kinds of things it's all industrialized and copyrighted and patented and all this kind of stuff exactly right it has to do with patents it has to do with mm -hmm. with with intellectual property basically right and so could so we see something very, similar right, that's right. With, with fish right you, all of a sudden you have a patented fish this is a fish that you know you know monsanto you know corporation um created a fish that was then um you know very you know likely to be you know resilient and therefore um does the, does it cause some some knock-on effects there or, or or something like that yeah i mean there's a scenario where where that kind of thing could happen particularly in the united states the intellectual property around seeds mm -hmm. um, has been a phenomenon that really dates back to the 1970s where all of a sudden not only buying bioengineered seeds but seeds that had been part of really the tradition of passing mm -hmm. seeds along from generation to generation. And the idea of seed banks that would happen in the community started to become intellectual property of different companies as well. There's a very famous case of exactly what you're talking about happening in Canada with the farmer named Percy Smicer, who mm -hmm. had some canola, I believe it was, it was growing on his property. And um at the time, Monsanto came onto his property and tested some of it and saw some of it was their product, Roundup Ready mm -hmm. Canola, and was forced to destroy a lot of his <laughs> seeds. Um, it bears commenting now that Monsanto, you know, is no longer a company because they were purchased by another pharmaceutical company <laughs> that many people have called have heard of called Bayer. And so oh, Bayer oh, yeah, okay. yeah. acquired uh, Monsanto about five years ago. And it was interesting tracking the website because Monsanto had its own website, of course, for a long time that was starting mm. to talk about of its own initiatives, starting to talk about sustainability in its own way. That was absorbed into the Bayer website for a long time into their agricultural division. And now that mm. has disappeared entirely. So the all of the negative press and associations that have go on, gone along with Monsanto have largely not largely, but to some degree disappeared mm -hmm. because people aren't talking about them anymore because it's not a company it has been absorbed by another company. Yeah. Um, and this has to do with the economic consolidation of food supply in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are, these are pharmaceutical companies that were buying up seed companies basically. Mm -hmm. And so there are fewer and fewer companies that are controlling our food supply. And if we get back to this collapse of fisheries, it seems that that once again would become more amplified, more and more mm -hmm. of an issue is that there are fewer and fewer number of companies that are responsible for a larger and larger percentage of growing food, processing mm -hmm. food, distributing mm -hmm. food, and then ultimately delivering and selling food to, to consumers. Yeah. Which, I mean, is never, we don't come out, we collectively you know me hunter you listening to this we're not going to be coming out ahead in those scenarios um right basically I mean, <laughs> and most you know we can argue about what would be good for the consumer mm. um certainly for many people who are involved in subsistence farming who are involved in small scale scale farming even who are, are involved in industrial farming on a family scale or something like that It'd be pretty easy to argue that this would be increasingly bad for these mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and i think the the biggest takeaway i'm ta i'm getting from this and i and i think i also got this from my episode um although again you know we're, we we dive so much more deep deeply into the these these topics on the the podcast um is just that the 
the biggest sort of what if scenario that, you know, and, and maybe it's not even a what if scenario, maybe it's more of an inevitable scenario. Um, because we've seen this play out with within other sort of food industries is the sort of conglomeration of corporatization of fish and mm -hmm. the ways that things will propagate to the profitability of a corporation and um not to get you know super socialist here but you know profitability of a corporation and the detriment of, of, of basically everybody else who's not part of that corporation I mean, ideally, on paper, capitalism, if it's exercised without monopolies, mm -hmm. um, there is a scenario in which that is beneficial to consumers mm -hmm. and to individuals in addition to the corporations. What's yeah. happened, though, is that we have near monopolies oftentimes with a mm -hmm. lot of food producers. And that is actually not, in, in some ways, that can be seen as anti-capitalist because, yeah. um, I mean, I mean, it's like, we have laws, for example, in the United States that are antitrust laws, mm -hmm. anti-monopoly laws, and there's exceptions to this. Um, but the idea is that that's actually some some economists and, and some commentators and politicians feel that, that that's actually not good for this economic system is to have a, a small number of companies, one company or a small number of companies that are controlling too many things. Right. There's like, yeah. there, I don't remember the name of the company, but there's a company that controls basically most of the chicken production in the in in the united states um and i really yeah, I wish think my... there, there are four companies that control mm. a large percentage of them yeah um i know that cargill is a company that is involved in in, in large percentages of, of various processing industries mm -hmm. you know, corn processing for example mm -hmm. so 40 percent or something like that is controlled by one company yeah um and you know it's not that corporations shouldn't exist it's not that mm -hmm. corporations shouldn't be able to, to to conduct business but if companies are controlling uh an enormous amount of the market share then there is no competition at that point and mm -hmm. then capitalism can't really function in the way that it's sort of outlined to function so whether you're you know pro or anti-capitalist mm -hmm. um you know, we can have conversations about what forms of these things should exist. It's not mm -hmm. all of the other thing. Um, and uh, anyways, the way that the food industries tend to be heading, um, you know, our scenario here suggests that it would further and disenfranchise a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, that's sort of a bleak scenario. <laughs> I'm so... <laughs> Collapse of fisheries bad, I think, is the conclusion. Here, right? You heard it here first. Um, collapse of fisheries not a good thing. Um, but I think the the a really important point to maybe remake is that um, because I think this does get conflated often is that um, collapse of fisheries doesn't mean no no more fish. Um, it just means that we're no longer able to really sustain ourselves, or that there's a, these other knock on effects for how we're able to sustain ourselves with fish that right. um, have have a number of negative um, sort of, you know, this or that, right? The scale of uh, fishing, the scale of the uh, food industry that involves fishing and seafood, mm -hmm. if fisheries were to collapse, would be transformed. Mm -hmm. Although aquaculture, albeit as forming a large and larger percentage of the food supply that people are able to have access to, we've already talked about that would be compromised to a certain degree as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's problems that, you know, we've only sort of touched on that go along with, with aquaculture as well. That could be something else we talk about in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, from a human perspective, from an environmental perspective, mm -hmm. from the perspective of other species, there is a, a lot to be concerned about with overfishing and, and collapse of, of fisheries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's probably even understating it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it sounds like we are, are, we're getting to the natural conclusion, um, of this episode, um, which has been an interesting one. Um, I, I, when I did this for my YouTube channel, um, I was very fascinated by a lot of sort of what we talked about here, um, and that we've now expanded upon here, um, even to my knowledge, um, because I think it's something that we don't really think enough about. Um, certainly as consumers, just as normal people, um, we're not really thinking, I think too heavily about, 
global fisheries collapse. Even the concept seems very nebulous. Um, yeah, so for I those think, of us who are, for those people who are in the industry, it's probably something mm-hmm. that's thought about all the time. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. For people whose diets are formed largely by fish, that's probably something that comes across. But for those of us who aren't, mm-hmm. yeah, this might be something that's that's uh, that doesn't come up as much, but it's something that would affect us very greatly if it were to come to pass. Yeah. And so with that, let's uh, let's let's do plugs, um, Hunter. I'm Hunter Shoby, and uh, if you want to find out about the kind of work that I do, I'll once again mention that I have a couple uh, books out there in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, cultural atlases, one called Portland is a Cultural Atlas, and the other Upper Left Cities, a Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, co-authored with David Bannis. And this is a good way to get to know uh, cities better, not just those particular cities. And so if you're so inclined, please check them out. Yeah. And you can, um, my name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me. Um, well, actually, so I, I didn't touch on this at the beginning, but, um, I, I'm, I'm going to be leaving Twitter, um, because, of Elon Musk things, Elon Musk reasons. Um, I'm going to just, I'm, I, so I'm starting up a Substack newsletter. You can find me there. Um, by the time this episode is published, you can follow me there and read sort of what I have to write or yeah, read what I have to write. Um, and that's just at geographic Jeff, uh, spelled G E O F F, um, geographic Jeff dot substack dot com. Um, yeah, subscribe there and you can see more of my maps and see sort of what I'm doing. And I don't know, I'll rope hunter into writing an article here and there as well. Sounds good to me. <laughs> it's a little more dynamic than Twitter is, which is all heavily reactionary. <laughs> so we get and here I don't of, have to react. I can just do whatever. 140 characters. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, exactly. It can be way more than 140 characters. I, I think Twitter's more than that now, but I don't know. Um, so um, follow me there and um, it's been fun and we'll see you thank next you time. Thank you for listening. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. See you next time.